Have you ever run into the situation where you're trying to finalize your mix and no matter what you do, you feel like there's this intangible quality that you can't quite put your finger on to really get it over the edge where it fits in with commercial mixes and feels really, really exciting and really kind of feels done to you. I think this is something that we all run into as we start to develop as producers and mixers. And I've found over the years that the difference between a mix that feels good, it feels balanced and it could go out into the world and the mix that feels really, really exciting, it fits with commercial mixes and it evokes emotion. The differences can really come down to a couple different different specific techniques and these really, really small things that you could be introducing in your production and your mixing phases that really help add that extra intensity and that extra emotion and dynamic. So in this video today, I want to go over five different techniques that you could be using to really level up your mixes and kind of finalize them. These are things that you don't have to do, but if you're finding that your mix is a little dull, it's a little lifeless, I think they can instantly spice it up for you. So we're going to dive in and we're going to check out those five techniques. But before we do, my name is Austin. You're watching Make Pop Music. We have weekly tutorials on music and music production. So if you like this video, make sure you subscribe because we have these every single Friday. If you want to support us, you can go over to our website, Make Pop Music, after the video and check out all of the really cool stuff we have over there. Sample packs, preset packs, MIDI packs, courses, free content that you can download, etc. So go over to makepopmusic.com after this video. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Let's go in and let's check out what these five techniques are that can really improve your mix. I'm in a mix right now. This is a pretty dense mix. It's something that I'm in the process of mixing and finalizing that I'll be releasing in the next few weeks. It's a song called Ruin My Life, and this song has a bunch of elements. It's like 110, 115 tracks total. And so when you're working with a dense mix like this and you really want the vocals and everything to pop, but you still want those synths to be heard, it can be really, really hard to find that balance. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna show you what these synths sound like, especially in this chorus, where there's a dense arrangement, lots of vocal stacks, etc. It sounds good, it sounds balanced. You can kind of hear everything, but you'll hear a couple issues. You can hear that the mix is just really thick. It feels a little bit crowded. And one thing that I like doing, especially in dense songs like this, is going to something like my Sense and Keys bus, or if you're in a guitar-driven song, going to your guitar bus, basically wherever your kind of musical bed ends up. And you can do something called mid-side EQ. I'm gonna be using Pro Q3 for this example, but a bunch of EQs have mid-side functions, including the stock EQ in Cubase. And what mid-side EQ is, is it basically allows you to process the middle of the stereo field and the sides of the stereo field separately. So so this is really, really important when I have something like a big synth bus that I don't want to crowd the vocals because vocals need to kind of be front and center. They're going to be the brighter element. But I kind of want to fill out these synths on the side and really make something that feels like this expansive kind of musical sound bed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add something like some mid-side EQ. And you can see right here that I'm going to do a 2 dB boost just on the sides at about 5K Hertz. So all you have to do to add mid-side EQ is go ahead and add your EQ wherever you want it. You could do a bell, you could do a cut, you could do whatever you want. And then in Pro Q3, you just hit this, you hit stereo placement, and then we're gonna go side. So now you'll see that we're just processing the side information. Check this out. As I mute it, you'll hear a little difference. Watch as I turn this on and off. You'll kind of hear it start to open up. The stereo field will get a little bit bigger. The synths will get a little bit brighter, but as we turn the full mix on, they're not gonna be getting in the way of the vocals or the snare drum or any of our other bright elements that kind of sit in the middle. So here is what it sounds like with it. Without it. And as we tuck it into the mix, you'll hear that it starts to make a decent difference. You could go heavier with this. You could go lighter with this. You could even do a scoop where, you know, maybe we want to take the mids out right around here where the vocals sit so we can open up a pocket for the vocals. This just really allows you to kind of shift around your synths or your guitars or any kind of melodic element to not be in the way of something like a vocal or a snare drum or some element that really needs to pop out of the middle. So here's what it sounds like in the full mix with doing a little bit of side boost EQ uh, right around 5K. Here's what it sounds like without it. Just doing that one little 2 dB boost that just kind of lifts the sides up really opens up the stereo field and makes the whole mix feel wider. It makes those vocals feel like they're much more open. They have a little bit more space to shine and it makes the whole mix a little bit brighter. And one of the things that I found is really, really exciting commercial mixes feel pretty bright without being aggressive and abrasive. And doing things like mid-side EQ can really allow you to kind of fine tune where things sit brightly because if they're just too bright, it's a little bit harsh. And if they're too dull, everything sounds a little bit muddy and stale. So try 
try doing some side lifts on things like synths or, um, you know, guitars or even hi-hats or background vocals, things that you don't need to sit right in the middle of the stereo field, add a little bit of lift to because it can make your whole mix brighter and more open. Let's move on to the second thing that I want to talk about, and that's doing parallel saturation. So parallel saturation just means that you're going to create a send or an effects track or a parallel track, whatever your DAW wants to call it. And then you're going to add some kind of saturation. And generally I'll do compression as well. So if I'm doing saturation, I'll do like decapitator, I'll do quadrifuzz and cubase, I'll do uh, the black box, uh, and then if I'm doing just saturation, I'll also compress it quite a bit with something like an LA-2A or um, an 1176 or something like that that I can really kind of squeeze pretty hard. For this example, I'm actually using Devil Lock by Sound Toys. This is kind of built off of a classic piece of hardware called the Level Lock, and this is going to be doing saturation and compression. So I have a fast release compressor happening, and then I have a bit of saturation happening with Crunch and Crush. And since I'm using this as a parallel chain, I'm going to keep this on 10 for the mix. I want it to be a 100% wet sound because I can blend this into my vocal. Baby, come make my night. Baby, come ruin my life. Oh, yeah. We can dim all the lights, show you things like never before. So it's that super saturated, super crushed sound. And what we're going to be doing is just blending that in a little bit with our vocal. So if you go right here, you can see that right now we're blending it in at negative 46.2 dB. So it's barely there. But as we listen in the mix, I'm going to turn this parallel saturation on and off. And you're going to hear how that really helps that vocal pop. Let me just solo the vocal so you can hear it. Baby, come make my night. Baby, come ruin my life. Oh, yeah. We can dim all the lights, show you things like never before. Baby, come fuck me right. Baby, come ease my mind. Don't come wondering why it's only one time. So you can hear when I engage this right here, when it has this S, that means that it's engaged. You can hear that it kind of opens up. Saturation is a really, really, really useful tool to add loudness. But if you oversaturate things, it becomes, you know, distortion. And that can be a cool characteristic or a cool creative choice, but if you don't want it to sound distorted, you can do things like adding this parallel saturation where yes, you have a bunch of saturation and compression happening, but since you're using it on a parallel chain or on an effects chain, you can subtly blend that in. Let me go ahead and show you what this whole mix sounds like. So I'm going to show you what the vocal sounds like with that saturation engaged. And then once, you know, I mute it, you'll see that it goes mute right here. You can hear how that vocal kind of falls towards the background. It's not going to sound like a super saturated, crushed, you know, distorted vocal, but once I have this in there, it just kind of jumps to the front of it. Take a listen. So I'll show you with first, and then I'll uh, take it off. You can hear that just by adding that little, little tiny effect in there at negative 46 dB, so you can barely hear it, you can feel it a lot. So when I take it out, again, it doesn't make the vocal feel distorted, but it does help that vocal jump to the front, especially in such a dense chorus like this where I have a lead vocal, I have left and right vocal stacks in unison, I have left and right low harmonies, left and right high harmonies, and then artificial vocals. It can be hard to really make that lead pop out of the center. And other than driving it super, super high and just killing my balance and killing a limiter, I wanted to add something that could add that perceived loudness without really making it feel just super, super loud and on top of the mix. So, you know, doing something like this parallel saturation, really, really good choice. Again, all you have to do, make a send or a parallel chain or an effects chain, whatever your DAW calls it. And then you can add saturation, you can add compression. Just make sure that if you're using it in parallel, you do 100% wet on whatever the effects is, and then you can just blend it into your sends on your main track and you're good to go. So now we have a vocal that's really popping out of the mix. The next thing I wanna talk about is something I don't know if I've ever mentioned on this channel and I never ever see it on YouTube, but it's something that I've been experimenting with a lot over the years, and it is just adding some kind of stereo widener or stereo you know, monoizer, basically, onto my long reverb. So if I go to my long reverb send right here, it's just Valhalla Vintage Verb on a three second hole, pretty bright, I've got some EQ kind of doing the Abbey Road technique right here just to sculpt it. But what I can do in this song is I can basically use something like S1 or any other stereo imager. And I'm going to automate this stereo width. So in the verses, the kind of long haul reverb is a little bit more narrow. And then as we get to the chorus, it's going to open up. And what that does is it kind of gives all of the vocals a really specific place. So if I go over here to the verse, you can see right here that we have this at 0.66. So that's more narrow than if we didn't have it. Let me show you.
So you can hear that we've kind of made it a little bit more narrow. If I turn it off, you'll hear that this kind of sits naturally where a hole would sit. Turn it on. So what that's gonna do is that's gonna tuck the verses more towards the middle where we're gonna have a vocal that doesn't feel really wide, it doesn't feel really eccentric or spacey. And what that does is as I automate that open for the chorus, it gives us one extra element of dynamics. And dynamics is really what makes a song feel exciting. So if we have this verse that feels really mono because it's one vocal up the middle with kind of a you know, smaller stereo field hall reverb. And then we open that up into the chorus where we have these really wide vocal stacks. We have the stereo imager actually going beyond 100%. It can just add a cool bit of excitement. It's really, really subtle in the mix. But if I solo the vocals, you'll kind of hear. So listen to how different this verse and chorus sound. You keep finding all these ways to catch my attention. I can see you shooting glances over my way. The way your silhouette is framing all of my vision Makes me think you want me to come get your name I it gives a perception that that vocal feels a little bit drier in that verse. Even though it's not, we're just bringing that into the stereo field a little bit. It feels really, really nice. And then once we go over to the chorus right here, you can see that we open up to basically like 1.6. So that's even wider than normal stereo. So here's what the chorus sounds like now. Come make my night, baby come ruin my life, oh yeah. We can dim all the lights, show you things like never before Baby come fuck me right, baby come ease my mind Don't come wondering why it's only one so as I engage it, it really helps those background vocals and that background reverb, so this big hole, sit off to the side. So again, now we have that synth feeling a little bit wider with that mid-side EQ that we added earlier. We have this vocal feeling punchier with that parallel saturation. And we have these vocals kind of sitting a little bit wider. So now the lead can really pop out of the middle, which really gives you a focused center of the stereo field. And then we have this really big side expanse of stereo field. And you can do that just by adding this imager. So I don't know if this is gonna translate because I'm gonna do it on my monitor controller here, but it may not translate to the actual YouTube video. I'm going to mono this. If you have a mono button or a mono plugin or something that you could do this as well, I just want to show you that this isn't going to ruin my mono compatibility. So right now we're at 1.6 on width. I'm going to turn mono on for my speakers. Come make my night, baby come on my life, oh yeah. We can dim all the lights, show you things like never before. Baby come fuck me right, baby come ease my mind. Don't come wondering why it's only... So as I engage this, it doesn't mess up my mono compatibility whatsoever because naturally a reverb is still going to have sound in the middle, sound on the sides, sound kind of everywhere in between zero and now 1.6, so 160%. You're not gonna lose that kind of mono compat compatibility, so just make sure that you don't stress yourself out if you add something like a stereo imager onto a delay or a reverb. It can be a really cool way to tuck things more into the middle and the verses and then open them up in the chorus. Or if you just wanna kind of narrow up or widen up whatever kind of reverb or delay you're using, it can add a little bit of extra sauce. And when you can play around with the stereo field, you can really get a mix that feels more open and more dynamic. And again, that can be that last little 5% that makes your mix sound different than a commercial mix. Since we're on vocals, the next thing that I wanna talk about is having all of your vocal kind of parallel send effects tracks come to a big return bus. So this is something that you could just do within your template and routing. So essentially, I have all of my vocals being sent out to my parallel widening, my parallel saturation, my long reverb, short reverb. But then all of these end up at a bus called vocal effects returns. So if we look at my buses or my, you know, groups or whatever you want to call them in your DAW, I have my lead vocals right here. This is all of my vocals dry. Come make my night, baby come ruin my life, oh yeah. We can dim all the lights, show it. And then I also have all of those effects tracks coming to this return track. And why I like doing this is because then I have options to do things like final EQ, where if you know all of my synths start to feel a little bit muddy and claustrophobic, I can take some mids out, I can take some lows out, I can boost highs, I could do mid side EQ on this if I wanted to. But more importantly, I have a place where I can easily just do a mute or do some automation. So let's take a look right here. And then all of that goes into a big all vocals bus. So this is my dry vocals for my lead vocals and my harmonies and my background vocals and this vocal effects. So this is all of my vocals and all of the effects tracks. Can make some mistakes. Baby, come make my night. Baby, come. So you can see right here, this little automation lane for the vocal effects returns allows us to automate all of our sins. So the long reverb, the short reverb, the quarter note delay, the eighth note delay, et cetera, everything down together. So if I want to do a big mute, especially before a chorus, 
I only have to do it in one spot. I don't have to do it on every single effects track or every single insert track. I can just do it on this big bus and I have the flexibility to process this as its own kind of stem or sound with things like EQ, compression, saturation, anything that I might wanna do to make those reverbs or those delays or those modulations feel a little bit more special. So if we take a listen, you'll see that all of those effects will start to swell down on this big phrase and then we have it come back in at 100%. And by doing that, it allows us to dry up that vocal. Let me turn off that automation read. So the vocal kind of reverb and delay will just continue. You can tell that this chorus doesn't hit as hard because it doesn't get dry before it hits. It's fine. It feels a lot better though with the automation. And we do that several places in here. We do it again back here. Again, if we don't have this bus or we don't automate everything down, it just feels a little bit stale. I don't get that big silence right before a big hit. And to me, creating dynamics like that can be the difference of having a chorus that feels huge and it pops and jumps out of the speaker and something that feels fine, it's balanced, but you kind of have those reverbs still going, you have those delays still going, or you just have to spend for freaking ever going in and automating every single send down, every single insert down. So have all of your effects kind of end up at a big return bus like this, so you have control over that entire effects group as one kind of unit. The last thing that I wanna talk about that can really add a little bit of punch and a little bit of depth to your mix is using something called a clipper. So I'm typically using uh, clippers on my drums, so kicks and snares mainly essentially really kind of transient elements that are kind of known for peaking limiters. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So if we go right here, I'll turn knock off. Uh, you can see that I'm gonna peak above zero. So it's not that big of a deal because in a DAW, I have kind of infinite headroom. So, you know, as long as I have a limiter on my output, I'm not gonna be getting that kind of clip distorted sound. However, what this is doing is it's eating up a lot of headroom in my limiter. So if we go to my final limiter down here, you can see that this kick is gonna peak this limiter. So I'm hitting my limiter and I don't even have the rest of my mix on there yet. And it's peaking at negative 1.2. That's just a quick example on how something like a kick or a snare can quickly eat up headroom in a limiter or a compressor because they're so transient and they have such a punch. So what you can do is you can add something called a clipper. I love the clipper by Knock. It's just Decap's plugin. I use this thing all the time. And he also sells it just as a clipper module. I have this just in case I wanna add anything else to this kick. But essentially what a clipper is gonna do it is going to just kind of chop off the top of that transient. And this allows you to get a lot more perceived loudness because instead of having that really pokey transient that's gonna peak a limiter or it's gonna peak your meter or something right here, it's just gonna chop that off and you're gonna get the fat sound that everybody can actually hear and still feel, but it's not gonna give you that you know, microscopic peaking that starts to add up over a whole mix. So with the knock engaged, with my clipper engaged, it sounds like this. So you can see that as soon as I turn it off, we start peaking at 2.3 again. Once I turn it off, we're peaking below zero. That's because of a clipper is essentially not gonna let you get over whatever threshold you have it set at. So if I turn you know, my channel here to two or whatever, it's still gonna peak because my clipper is essentially limiting it to zero right here, and then my fader is essentially right here. So your clipper is just gonna basically not let it get above whatever your meter ends up being at the very, very end. And this is really, really great because as you add it to things like kicks and snares, it starts to eat up less headroom in your limiter and in your uh, compressor. So as you start to do, especially your two bus automation or your mastering or anything like that, you can get a lot more perceived loudness without peaking these, which is gonna add that kind of digital clipping and that dithering and that artifacting. So you can see now we're good to go. So all you have to do to kind of make your drums feel a little bit louder and not peak your compressors or peak your limiters is add something like a clipper. You can go soft clipping, so you can have something like this. Or you can make it really, really gnarly. This is gonna add that kind of like blocky, super knock kick. I don't want it to be that cut, so I'm gonna go 
like 40% soft and hard. So it's generally a soft clipper and I'm not doing too, too much clipping. And you can do this to kicks, snares, anything that you want in your mix. And it's just gonna add a little bit of headroom. So instead of, you know, if your kick is not feeling loud or if you're having an issue where your drums just peak and they just drive your compressors or limiters, try adding clippers to your kicks and snares because it, it can be a good way that you can add in some extra punch and extra loudness without having those, you know, transients. I printed a little bit of an example just so you could really, really see. So here is the kick that I printed with no clipper. This is just a normal kick drum. You can see that we're peaking at 1.4, but it doesn't feel super hard. It doesn't feel super punchy and aggressive. Let's go to our kick right here that does have a clipper, and I'm gonna engage it so you can see. Now we're not peaking. We're still at negative zero, and it feels much louder. So this is just a cool little example of how adding clipper can add that perceived loudness. Where my meters say that this kick is quieter, however, my ears are telling me that this kick feels much louder. So here's no clipper, clipper. They feel so different. Again, this can really just add that punch and that intensity. If you're having trouble getting your kicks or your snares to really pop out of a mix, add something like a clipper so you don't eat up a ton of headroom in your limiter or compressor, but you can still get them to punch and to knock and to sound super, super uh, heavy. But that's gonna do it for this video. Those are our five tips that you could be including in your production and your mixing that are gonna add a little bit of punch, a little bit of depth, a little bit of width, and a little bit of dynamic. So you can really get that final five or 10% on your mix and it can feel like an exciting, uh, you know, commercial ready mix that you are proud to put out. If you like this video, please make sure that you like, comment, and subscribe. That really helps out our channel a bunch. We're trying to grow the channel. We do videos like this every single Friday. So if you're a producer or an artist or a mixing engineer, make sure you subscribe because we have bangers come out every single week and we haven't skipped a week in like, I think a year. So go ahead and subscribe because we have a ton of free content like that coming for you. We also have a bunch of content over on our website. We have sample packs, we have preset packs, we have a start to finish production course. It's like 76 videos in 14 and a half hours. If you want to check that out, that's at makepopmusic.com. You can get a link to that in the description below. Go check it out. It supports us on this channel. We really, really appreciate it. But other than that, let us know what you want to see in the comments down below. We'll be back next week with much more content. We'll see you then. Much love. Peace.